ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure most of us out here know that and this is a little old data. He's going to update uh, me with the new data because I haven't been able to un understand and, uh, the, the new report that uh, UNDP has on the Human Development Index. But India, in the previous data, uh, it will rank 134 in Human Development Index, which is one slot, I think, above Laos and two slots above Burma. Uh, at the same time, India is fifth in the list of the Forbes list of billionaires. So I think this is what uh, is going to be the, the tone and tenor of today's discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. Welcome to another edition of IDSA Internal Security Lecture Series. And with me is someone, you can see him, so uh, it's not as mysterious as I'm trying to make up. But uh, I'm tempted to quote Amartya Sen, who described him as one of the world's great experts on famine and hunger. P. Saina, the Max S. A. Award winner. He has probably won all national and international journalism awards, and I will not go into that, because he calls himself a rural reporter. He still prefers to call himself a reporter. Now, how is his work related to internal security? And you know, no prizes for guessing that. Many securities is what we thought the title of today's lecture should be, considering we, as in we all, tend to understand security out here uh, you know, from traditional security paradigms. Whereas Sinat's vocabulary security has much more serious implications, and that's what we'll try and understand today. I had initially proposed to him a talk on left-wing extremism, to which he said that I would not like to pose as an expert on left-wing extremism. And let me tell you, he has done substantial work in those areas, though he still says that he does not want to call himself an expert on that. He said that I would broadly discuss the situation in the countryside, some of the factors arising which feed into that extremism. So, ladies and gentlemen, P. Okay. Thank you very much, Kishlai. And uh, as Kishlai said, I'm not going to pose as an expert on Maoism. I do work <coughs> in areas like Chhattisgarh and Malkangiri, Koraput, a lot of work in those eyes. I'm willing to discuss questions that you might have about what I come across and what I run into in those areas. I'm certainly willing to do that. And, uh, um, but I <coughs> would like to approach this differently today. I'm not uh, going to step into a frame in which I have neither the competence nor the content. I'm going to talk about exactly what the title is, many securities, the different kinds of security that are important for a nation, for a society. Um, I would say that a nation that condemns the majority of its people to everyday indefinite insecurity can never be secure itself. That's the first proposition. If you condemn the overwhelming majority of your people to instability, everyday insecurity, you can never as a nation be secure. Second, I will state without hesitation that the single biggest source, our single biggest source of insecurity, I totally diverge from what Dr. Manmohan Singh makes as the single biggest source of our insecurity internally. I would say that the single biggest source of our insecurity is the incredible, unsustainable levels of inequality that we have built very consciously in the last 20 years. Those levels of inequality take us back for any comparisons that you want to make. The only er time and period with which you can compare is that of the colonial Raj. Now what's different between existing inequalities in India and earlier? There was inequality in India. We all know that. It's not a secret. It's not that it wasn't there before in 60 years. But there's a big difference. Oh, incidentally, let me, let me digress to point out that the, what I am talking to you about as the single biggest danger was exactly the core of the speech made by the architect of this constitution of India when he handed it over to the constituent assembly. When Dr. Ambedkar handed over the draft constitution for discussion and adoption, I believe that that speech which Ambedkar made that day remains the greatest speech in parliament before there was parliament. 
and the core of that speech says today we live in a, we have stepped into an extremely dangerous and paradoxical time i'm not quoting verbatim i'm paraphrasing him it's a long thing but the core phrases are correct he says we enter a dangerous paradox we have built ourselves a fine political democracy but in society and economy there is no democracy and there is no equality the tension between the inequality in social and economic terms can explode our political democracy this was the founder the architect of your primary architect of your constitution as he handed over the draft constitution for discussion and adoption that was the speech ambedkar made 63 years later you have to say that he got it absolutely right that is the single greatest tension in your society the tension between what's happening in economy and society and political democracy okay. uh, <clears throat> so in what's the difference between the inequality of, that you see today in india post 91 and the inequality that you had earlier in earlier periods i would say one central difference if you look from the 50s the planning period right up to the 80s if you take various measures of inequality say inequality in wages inequality at the uh, at the top end of the spectrum in salaries between 50s and the 80s inequality in those terms actually declined in the country it actually declined maybe not as you and i would have liked to see it decline at least certainly not as i would have liked to see it decline but it declined from the late 80s it begins an upward trend once again from the 90s it takes off it really takes off at levels that you cannot imagine i'll come to the numbers which kishlai was mentioning the undp but that's one measure but it's still important the difference then that central difference between what happens in the 90s and this decade and india before that is that never has inequality in independent india been so consciously constructed so ruthlessly engineered on the premise that it is a good thing greed is good accumulation is good you have to create that wealth then there's going to be a trickle down effect that economics stands disgraced and discredited across the world including in the home model from where we have adopted it okay you're looking at europe in turmoil today you're looking at the united states in a in a completely vulnerable economic situation for the last several years is it yeah. is it just put that off it's whether you're looking at the united states or europe you're looking at a completely you're looking at a model of trickle down economics that has completely failed and is in utter discredit utterly discredited and disgraced okay uh here we still stand by it we still swear by it it shows in every single policy dimension of our of our policy making activity when kishlai was talking about what our position is in the un human development report even in the disgraceful position that we are our hdr value is 0.548 and that places us below every single latin american nation that you can think of when you take the multidimensional poverty index however when you factor inequality into the index you fall a further 30% the hdr value of 0.548 comes down to 0.3741 or something uh, 374 you're losing 30% in the very limited human development value that you have once the moment you factor in inequality the difference between see there are, there were two phases in the un human development report i finish with that so that we can then move on to actual much more alive things one is in 98 major changes were made in the un human development the un human development report was actually a indo pakistani concept professors mehboobul haq and amartya sen together devised the human development report it was a huge advance over existing ways of understanding how people did 
because it moved away from a very stupid per capita growth or per capita income measure to include other measures of how human beings are doing. Now this per capita thing as you know is extremely misleading. If my income is 10 million dollars a year and all of you are earning 100,000 rupees a year, the average per capita income of this room will reflect nobody's reality. And in societies which are extremely heterogeneous and class and caste hierarchies of very, very rigid and uh, terrible nature, that averaging, like India's literacy is an average between East UP and Kerala. Okay. You, your averaging doesn't help you in that kind of a dimension unless you have many, many factors which you look at in trying to understand inequality and how human beings are doing. So when you have that, you'll start, you'll start in 98, Richard Jolly produced a report for the United Nations which angered everybody because it showed us how bad things were. So then they changed the methodology and from around 89, 2000, they started using a different methodology. Whichever period you take from the 90s, it, the human development report's life is coterminous with our reforms period. And our, act, and our functioning in that has been one of decline in rank. The more billionaires we have accumulated, the worse we are doing on human development. The greater the concentration of the wealth, the worse we are doing on human development. How do we square this off? It's a question. It then argues more, even deeper inequality. Well, in the 2011 report, they changed the methodology again. They brought in different indicators of indexes. They brought in a the general index of the UN Human Development Report in which we are about 119 out of 160, 160 nations, 150 nations. Then they brought in the multi-dimensional poverty index where you fall to 134. Okay. They brought in the gender inequality <laughs> index. They brought in the gender inequality index in which you fall to a disastrous 126 out of just some 146 nations or so which are on that index. You stand completely exposed What's very important is not just that those Latin American countries and some African countries are ahead of you. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that all those poor countries that are ahead of you, not one of them has had 9% growth. Not one of them is the fourth largest military power in the world. Not one of them is the sixth nuclear power on the planet. Not one of them has had your, has your scientific, technological, human skills, capability, resource pool. And yet they've done better. How is that? How is it that Botswana does better than you on every count? If you take your own planning commission's human development report, have, are you aware that a few months ago that the planning commission wing had a human India human development report? I quote for you verbatim, malnourishment rate amongst Indian, India's children. Excuse me. Can we generally switch off our mobile phones if we... I think keeping them silent is not good enough. It's disturbing. Yeah. So the India Human Development Report, which is published by an arm of the Planning Commission of India, states malnourishment rate of India's children under the NHFS, the National Family House Health Survey, three, is forty six percent. Is forty six percent, which is roughly double the rate of malnourishment amongst children of sub-Saharan Africa. This is not a UN report. It is the government of India's planning commission human development report. Okay. Your, now sub-Saharan Africa is not the world's greatest IT superpower. It is not a software superpower. It doesn't have a fraction of the kind of human resources that we do. Okay. It doesn't have the pool of knowledge and skills that we are so inordinately and excessively proud of. Yeah. How the heck did they do that? Take the, take the Global Hunger Index. You take any index that you want. Okay, I've, I've talked about the Planning Commission's index. There is a Global Hunger Index, which looks at underweight children, proportion of hungry population. The Global Hunger Index comes from the think tank, which some of you might be knowing of, called the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, in Washington, D.C. 
our position and rank in the global hunger index has been has moved in inverse proportion to our wealth and accumulation okay i mean one can interpret the progress rates differently but not the rank today we rank out of 81 of the world's hungriest nations we rank in descending order 67 67 all your south asian neighbors are ahead of you okay you rank 67 out of 81 here you are 9% growth for a decade where does it show where does it show in benefits for your people okay 67 out of 81 in the global hunger index by the way all the reports that i'm using not not one of them is confidential or secret they are public they are public you can access them from here including the the india human development report they have not yet put that up online they haven't yet put that up online because they're trying to sell it for money for a while and then they will put it up online i guess but uh, but but the, but that's the fact now if you take the global hunger index look at the countries uh, If you want to know who who we have managed to nudge ahead of, we've beaten the pants of Zimbabwe. I hope you're all very thrilled with that achievement. Because by the way, four years ago, Zimbabwe was ahead of us. Yeah, so we make progress. They used to have another indicator which they've dropped. It's called the Global Hunger Progress Indicator. How you have improved in your handling of hunger. for the years that they had that index ethiopia was ahead of us every year on that index that they were handling their hunger better not that they were they, they were below us in the rank but the handling of it was better so that's how you are in the global hunger index 67 out of 81 malnourishment you should know today that 31% of the world's stunted children are indian citizens 31 in every 3 stunted child in the world is an indian citizen okay and that is directly related to malnourishment i i was uh, before the parliamentary standing committee on the farm crisis a few days ago and i made a small calculation for them of what happens in your country for a parliament during a parliament session the last parliament session was 38 days 38 days november 22nd to december 29th typically what happens in your country in 38 days in 38 days 1786 farmers commit suicide that's the, that's the average 47 a day one every half hour mr pillai that's a home ministry figure from the national crime records bureau of the government of india home ministry uh, according to police for every suicide that succeeds there are 10 to 12 failed attempts that's the police uh, calculation <clears throat> ngos and organizations working on suicide reject that figure they say it's 15 to 20 times but let's take the police calculation which means that if 1786 farmers commit suicide in 38 days of parliament it means between 18000 to 21000 attempted in 38 days by the way if we take the census figures on the farm population and here brings me back to the issue of insecurity people are leaving agriculture at the rate of 2000 a day if you want the exact figure it's 1938 between the 1991 census and the 2001 census 7 and a half million farmers quit agriculture you did not create 7 and a half million jobs the marginal subsistence farmer quitting in telangana doesn't go into infosys okay where do they go you don't even have a mechanism which counts the dropouts beyond the census figure once in 10 years so uh, it means that if 7 and 1/2 million people left in 10 years it means 1938 people on average are leaving farming every day you have no nothing you've created nothing by way of employment in that in in any sector that absorbs that kind of numbers on a round the year basis if we are looking at deaths related to malnourishment hunger and birth care then we are talking about 38 days 70000 deaths if we take the government of india's measures of how many children die if we take unicef measures of how they die 
that shoots up to more than 90,000. Uh, besides, entirely besides all this, tens of thousands of more children in 38 days enter what are known as, I don't know if you are familiar with it, grade 3 and grade 4 malnourishment. Grade 3 and grade 4 malnourishment are levels of malnourishment from which there is virtually no return. There is virtually no return. I think it's actually the... Uh, no, no, it's the outside, the phones on the corridor. On the corridor, okay. It's uh, uh, great, a child who has entered grade 4 malnourishment, you can save the child's life. You can't save the child's mind or physiology ever. That's gone. That's finished. That child is finished. Full retrieval from grade 3 chances are there. But grade 4, beyond that level, there's no, there's no comeback. There's nothing that you can do about it. That child is damaged. Mentally, cranium capacity, all kinds of serious damage is suffered by that child. But here's, uh, you know, that, shall I just try this? Or maybe I'll just put this up. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm sure you can hear me and anyway I'm being recorded. I don't think I need this. Uh, but let's look at what is happening at the other end of that spectrum in the same 38 days. How many of you read the budget of India? How many of you read the economic survey of India and the government of India's budget annually? You have to. You, you had no choice. But yeah. But voluntarily, how many of you read? Except the, not the whole thing. Okay. I suggest, I suggest two pages, two, two documents, which you should read every year. I'm not asking you to read more than 10 pages. Okay. One is a section called Statement of Revenue Foregone. It's an annexure to the budget. Hmm? Statement of Revenue Foregone. Uh, Statement of Revenue Foregone talks about what are the taxes that the government has written off for the elite of your nation, for the richest people in your country for the corporate world. Hmm. This is very, very important. I said to, I made one central proposition for you at the beginning of this discussion. One, that the biggest source of insecurity in this country is the growing inequality. Two, corollary, is that the sheer, sheer indifference we show and the justification of that inequality, even the celebration of it, which we have seen in the last 20 years, is a huge threat to your stability, as a cohesiveness as a society. It's shameful to me, there is something very sick and degenerate about a society that has to debate whether it is our duty to feed the hungry or not. The fact that you are having a debate over the food security bill nauseates me. In which other society is that a huge debate? In which of those European societies and Western societies that we try making models is that a debate outside of the United States where you have something called social security, which there are people who want to tear down. The standard answer is there is no money. Where is the money? Uh, Here is the money. Look at statement of revenue foregone. 5 lakh crores in concessions under three heads to the richest people in your country. Direct corporate income tax write-off, which means it benefits four of our guys who are on the Forbes billionaires list. Oh, 55 of our guys, sorry. 55 and four who are in the top 15 rich. Okay. Just direct corporate income tax write-off in this budget, 2011-12, 88,263 crores. That's 242 crores a day right off. In 38 days, when 1,786 farmers kill themselves, that write off is worth 9,200 crores or $1.84 billion to the richest 0.01% of your society. Let me, let me pose the 90,000 crores figure another way. 90,000 crores is what it costs you, the high end estimate, to have, sir, a universal public distribution system. 
the highest estimate of a universal public distribution system is 90,000 crores, which means that every Indian citizen would have access to food. Okay. I think the food security bill is nonsense actually, because the constitution of India does not have APL and BPL and priority. It's based on citizenship and the directive principles of state policy tell you exactly what a citizen is due to. I believe that these bills actually water down what are the entitlements of, of the Indian people. But that's a, that's a debatable issue. The fact is that you have 90,000 crores to write off. Oh, by the way, what's 90,000 90, crores is direct corporate income tax. Let's take customs duties. After petroleum, which benefits the whole nation, which is the single biggest customs exemption? Any, anyone has an idea? Jim. Gold, diamonds and jewelry. 49,500 crores is the write-off. But you don't have money. You cut four, in the same budget, you cut 450 bill, 450 crores from food, from food subsidies. In a nation that has 31% of the world's stunted children, in a nation which has the double the proportion of sub-Saharan Africa in malnourished children. You cut 450 crores, but you had 49,500 crores as the write-off for gold, diamonds, and jewelry, the second biggest write-off in customs. Well, if you add excise duty, okay? If you take the write-offs, uh, I'm very pleased that after 10 years of refusing to see this, Amartya Sen finally mentioned it in an article in the Hindu, which I suspect you saw. By the way, we have been publishing that figure in the Hindu I, since 2006 when the data became available. He has taken note of it. I am grateful to him. I wish he had done so 10 years ago. But, but what is 500,000 crores? It's two and a half times your 2G scam at the high end estimate of the 2G scam. If you take your high end estimate of 2G scam, 1,79,000 crores, then the concessions you are giving to the corporate sector, these are not the subsidies. These are the write-offs. The subsidies are something else. The freebies are something else. Those are given in the SCZs. Those are given by state governments, by central governments, in concessions, in municipal taxes, in water taxes. Those are millions of other subsidies. I am just talking about corporate karza mafi. Okay? But you don't have money for poor people. You don't have money for health. You don't have money for education. How many of you read yesterday's report on education in the Times of India? 50% of all your children are dropping out by class 7. More than half of that 50% drop out by class 3. Yeah. Okay, so at one end of the world, you have your IITs and IIMs and you are the dominant face of Silicon Valley. At the other end, hundreds of millions of children are outside school. Okay, you made a great thing about your enrollment ratio being so good that 100% enrollment. How the heck does it matter if of your 100% enrollment, 50% drop out by class 7, 25% drop out by class 3? How does your 100% enrollment matter? Okay. Uh, the numbers again will later, but the idea of more securities is that there is such a thing as food security. There is such a thing as livelihood security. There is such a thing, an extremely important thing for food security called environmental security. Okay. Anyone who steps up to what, was, what we were so proud of in the Punjab all these years, please look at the loss of soil fertility. 25%, 30% loss in soil fertility. Your yields are not just plateaued, they are declining rapidly. And we are using... To fight the problem we have created with chemicals, we are using more chemicals and more pesticides. It's like a medical system where we create a drug for blood pressure, which by the way I have to take. Then we create drugs for the side effects of that and then other drugs for the side effects of those drugs. We are running agriculture on steroids in this country. And the result and finally what happens with steroids will happen with agriculture. There is such a thing as resource security. If people cannot be sure of where their, whose hands their resources will be tomorrow, 
my point is that if you focus on a standard understanding of <coughs> national security, whether in terms of internal security or securing your borders, we may be missing the wood for the trees where many of those whose security we are concerned with have no stake in either our security or our nation. I think it's something worth thinking about. You know, who are you fighting for? What do they think of what we are fighting for? What stake do they have in your nation? If you dispossess millions of people of their resources, what stake do they have in our security and in our nation? Um, whether you look at it in terms of, well, look, look at education for instance, again, the, out of every 100 children who join school, 25 have dropped out within two years, 50 have dropped out within five years. In the richest state of Maharashtra, se less than 7% of girls go beyond high school in most districts. Okay. And that's a rich state. That's an incredibly rich state. How much of your wealth is concentrated in Maharashtra? It's also the state with the worst number of malnourishment deaths from male guard, which is now infamous. It is the state with the highest number of farm suicides by far, 20,000 more than the next state, which is Karnataka. And beyond food security, there is something else which those who are worried about security should reflect on. There is something I would call, and it's not, not invented by me, food sovereignty. Who controls the process of production in your country? Today, for instance, in many third world countries, and we have begun the process here, a couple of companies control the seed. Today in India, one company controls cotton seed. You are the biggest, second biggest cotton producer in the world. The single biggest cotton region in the world is in your country. Vidarbha, many people don't realize, is bigger than Punjab, sir. Punjab is 50,000 square kilometers. Vidarbha is 52,500. The six districts of cotton growing are, are twice, twice the size of Kerala, 52,000 kilometers. Okay? Kerala is about 38,000, so about one and a half times. Yeah. So that is, that is the Vidarbha. A single company controls and holds the destinies of these people in the costliest seed in their history, moving from 9 rupees a kilogram for local seed in 1991 to about 2,000 rupees per kilogram now, or 950 rupees for a packet of 450 grams. Whole issues of food sovereignty are coming up, of environmental security as land and forest gets degraded, soil, soil gets degraded. Yeah, but our, our phones are off here. I don't know whether it's the mic of the camera. No, it's not that. All the microphones are off. We need mic security. Yeah, we do. Sorry. So, yeah, so all these, but let me, let me, uh, you know, bring you back to the discussions and debates of the last four or five years. How many people, how many educated Indians are aware that your government, while celebrating 9% growth, etc., has felt compelled to have set up in four years, four years, three high-level bodies to look at rural poverty numbers. If you were doing so brilliantly, why do you have three commissions? Well, there is a reason why governments in India traditionally have multiple committees on a subject. Government of Maharashtra has had about 12 inquiries on farmer suicides. The reason for that is very simple. Typically, governments will have 10 commissions on a subject until one of them gives them the report it wants. Okay? So, that's how it happened with the poverty issue. In 2007, they got the NCEUS the National Commission for Enterprises in the Unorganized Sector. And they gave it to someone whom they thought was very safe. He had all the credentials required. He had worked with the World Bank. He had worked with the IMF, good middle of the road economist, uh, planning commission, Dr. Arjun Sen Gupta. And he produced a report which said on the first page, 836 million Indians are living on 20 rupees a day or less. 
they were scandalized and outraged by that report. First page of the report says it. It also gives you a breakup of who the 836 million people are. Please look, I mean, you, you know, your inequality has a face, many faces. It tells you 88% of all Dalits, 88% of all, Ad, uh, of all Adivasis, 85% of all Muslims, 85% of all OBCs fall into these 836 million people who live on 20 rupees a day or less. Okay, you can update that price index wise to your 32 rupees and uh, 26 rupees a day. You can update it, which, okay, as you know, your planning commission twice filed affidavits before the Supreme Court, one in April, one a couple of months ago one last April, one a couple of months ago, in which it adjusted its own figures. In April, it filed an affidavit defending, defending the 20 rupees cut off as a poverty line. Then it up in, by November, December, it filed a new petition upgrading that, which is simply a price indexing issue to 32 rupees and 26 rupees. 32 rupees as the expenditure in urban areas, urban consumer expenditure and 20 ru 26 rupees for rural areas, which is when, as you know, many people challenged Dr. Montek Singh to show us how to live on 32 rupees or 26 rupees. Okay. At the one end of the spectrum, we do not even want to look at, anyway, they were so angered by this report, they set up a second committee. For my sins, I was a member of that. It was the NC Saxena committee. BPL expert group, where we had scintillating expert discussions for two hours on one occasion on whether women were really poor. Okay. By the way, that was a vast improvement on the previous BPL census, where female headed poverty was discussed in even more extraordinary terms. On the, I, I have the, I have the cutoff sheet. Okay, the tick on which you tick off the the criteria and the weightage. Plenty of weightage was given to one check. How to determine poverty amongst women and the women-headed households? Uh, household with one sari only, one to two sari households, two to three sari households. What if the household has six women in it? They're fine, and each of them has one sari. They actually had such a tick off on the cut on the on the check. Now here's even a more wonderful thing. In that, in that discussion, my three of us were isolated trying to argue that there is no need to discuss this. All the evidence in the world shows us that women headed households are not poor, they are ultra poor. There is no, I mean you can go back to evidence from the 1950s in this country. There is no, there is no uh, report or research that shows you otherwise. Why are we discussing this? This scintillating discussion was conducted by 17 people, 95 percent upper caste, 100 percent upper class, not a person in the room earning less than 70,000 rupees a month and every one of them male, no woman in sight in a mile, but we had this furious discussion on whether women headed households should be automatically listed as poor or not. There were three, four of us who argued that this is an idiot debate. Okay, Can we just move on? You will be glad to know that finally we sort of accepted that they are a little poorer than they are not doing so well as us. So something like that I think was the compromise, but that was the second committee. It brought down the 77 percent figure of Arjun, of Arjun Sen Gupta <coughs> to a more manageable 53 percent, which of course still dismayed the government of India, because how the hell are you going to puff your 9 percent growth when you are saying that <coughs> rural poverty is higher. So then they brought Dr. Suresh Tendulkar into the picture to lower the figure, which he did obligingly. And uh, uh, let us not even go into private sector debates on poverty, how, how those figures are constructed. That is for a stand-up comic to tell you. Okay. But, uh, but here is the fact that Tendulkar's figures were also substantially higher than those of the government of India. In other words, in four years, at the peak of your 9 percent growth, three committees officially constituted by the government of India 
told the government of India that it needed to revise its rural poverty figures upwards. We haven't done it. We are still filing affidavits in the Supreme Court to fight it out. So you have this kind of insecurity. Then you have the insecurity that the departure of seven and a half million people from agriculture has caused you. Uh, the government has lined up all its pet demographers to start screaming at the moment to talk about this, but migrations have gone out of hand in your country. Incidentally, if you look at a 2003 UN Habitat report you know, on the planet and slums in the planet, the prediction for the world for 1930, which is what, 18 years away? By 1930, a third of all humanity will live in urban slums. The two biggest concentrations will be Africa and India. Now, visually you can see that happening. You have the evidence of your eyes around you in the cities. By the way, just get out of here. Go to the homeless shelters that have been set up around the city. Look at the thousands of people who have come in from UP, Bihar and elsewhere and look at, try measuring their despair, if you can create an index for that. Now, what's happening in the countryside as agriculture collapses? Apart from the fact that you've had a quarter of a million farmers commit suicide between 1995 and 2010, and in those 16 years, the second eight years are much worse than the first eight years. Okay. The clock is ticking. One every 30 minutes is the average. I don't see what security as a nation you can have if your farmers are committing suicide at the highest rate of suicide seen in recorded human history. What is your security? What does your security mean to that family? What sort of national security do we have while we undermine the security and livelihood security of hundreds of millions of people? I, I find it's almost so, somewhere there's something Kafkaesque about this that we completely destroy the security of millions, their livelihood security, their resource security, their food security, their food sovereignty, their control over their daily lives and try understanding national security in the terms that we traditionally do, somewhere we are going horribly, horribly wrong. But in the same 20 years, oh, let me put it this way to you. Let's accept the government of India's figures on BPL, which is nonsense. There is, I, I'm not getting into that debate because I think the BPL, APL debate is rubbish. But, and if you want, I can in discussion tell you why it is so. But if we accept the government of India's figures on the number of people below the poverty line, that happens to be, by the way, the fourth biggest nation in the world. Yeah? It's bigger than Indonesia. So it is the fourth biggest nation in the world. What security are we talking about? We are talking about the fourth biggest nation in the world, dispossessed, hungry, malnourished, huge rates of infant mortality, Terrible rates of stunting, terrible rates of cranium damage, capacity damage, physiological damage, psychological damage, and then we talk about security. The same period with 9% growth, India produced $55 billionaires. That makes you, by the way, as Kishul, I told you at the beginning, ranking fourth now or fifth in the latest Forbes list of billionaires. What it also means, by the way, if you add up the wealth Kishloi, of those 55 billionaires, they account for one-fifth of your GDP. Okay. Hmm? Probably gone up because they hold their wealth in dollars. Their wealth is estimated in dollars. Okay. The rupee, which once used to be a currency, has now to be measured differently. What's it now? 53 bucks? Yeah. So these guys, notionally, they've gone up. You know what $55 billionaires means? Uh, you didn't have one in the first list. Okay? You have 55 now, and your rank in human development has fallen by every parameter in rank. I'm not talking about interpretations of progress, which you can do endlessly, which is what one of our, our genius lies in doing that, that interpretation of progress. But 55 billionaires on the one hand, 836 million people who live on 20 rupees a day or less on the other. Okay. What security will you provide for that nation? 55 guys accounting for a fifth or a sixth of your GDP, notionally at least, equivalent of that wealth. Yeah. 
and seven and a half million people leaving 750,000 people leaving farming every year 2,000 leaving every day what kind of security will you possess you know in the list of billionaires the US is of course the 800 pound gorilla at the top the only two nations that have moved ahead of us are China and uh, Russia but let me let me wet your patriotic fervor by telling you that China and Russia are pretenders they have more billionaires but their billionaires are poorer than our billionaires our dads are richer than their dads. The average net asset worth of the Chinese billionaire is uh, what about one and a half to two billion. The net asset worth of the Indian billionaire is three and a half billion, three billion plus. And then there is our obvious moral superiority. We are a democracy. At the end of every five years, the Russians send all their billionaires to prison. We send ours to parliament. <laughs> Okay, look, the levels of obscenity, the levels of inequality that we have developed, the levels of hunger, insecurity, livelihood, security, food, these are now obscene. The only way you go forward from here is down. That's the only way you go from here. You're in trouble on all these parameters. I didn't, as I said, I, I've skipped, we can, we can get to, in the discussion to Mavis and Malkangiri and everything else that you wish to. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that we are in also involved in a number of other active processes that undermine your insecurity, including the UID. Okay. By the way, that outsourced biometric work, you can buy that data on the streets of Mumbai. It's already made its way there. What sort of national security will you have when your biometric data is up for grabs all around the planet? You outsourced it to subcontractors who have subcontracted it to further people it's now available in the streets of Mumbai biometric data another thing let me tell you about this stupid stupid idea anywhere in the world anywhere in the world there is no no one who has made a success of the UID type of system the UK started this kind of national identification system abandoned it in four months Australia had collapsed at the discussion stage no other country has made a success of it and one, no one claims that it is technologically infallible and three very importantly in any society there is five percent to seven percent of the population that do not have fingerprints in India that is 15 percent plus because of agricultural labor they do not have fingerprints okay the washer women don't have fingerprints a lot of professions in India and those are the very people who will get this uh, uh, de-accessed from your public distribution system using the UID. The, the very people who need your public distribution system, the very people who need your social sector benefits will be the very people excluded from it because they don't have fingerprints. Okay, You are asking for big, big trouble with this project. Now, um, I, I told Kishlai at the beginning and I should have told you you're welcome. You were welcome to have interrupted me. At